Hello and welcome to Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel, independent and impartial. Now, this week we take a look inside the world of media, analysing the trends, the issues and the reporting of some of the week's top stories. Thanks for joining us. I'm Pete Endor and this is what's coming up on the show today. We'll be unpacking the media coverage of building up to the elections that have just been and take a look uh, past uh, uh, this Wednesday as we probe what exactly has the media been reporting. Now, World Press Freedom Day was observed a week ago. Uh, we take a look at how well South Africa is doing in the World Global Press Freedom Rankings and press freedom in general, actually, across the continent as well. We ask you to share your views with us on Twitter at SA Media Monitor. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are during the course of the program. As usual, we'll also get our guests to editors to unpack the Sunday papers. And uh, these are some of the stories that uh, we'll be tackling on the show. But first, let's take a look at the front pages of your Sunday newspapers this morning. Right, here are the papers, starting with the Sunday Times, whose front page looks like this. Uh, it boldly declares that Cyril rescues the ANC. Now, this talks about the ANC's victory in the general elections, suggesting that it was uh, due to President Ramaphosa's personal appeal to the voters in the face of an ANC, uh, what some people say was punished for state capture and corruption. The City Press also leads with President Ramaphosa saying that he has big plans for his administration, trimming cabinet and targeting service delivery as key priorities. The paper suggests that he has difficult decisions to make regarding who to leave out of government as he tries at the same time to keep his divided party together. The Sunday Independent has also taken a front page view on the president's uh, next cabinet and the paper says not even Deputy President uh, David Mabuza is a sure thing. The story says that lobbying is underway for a new number two, saying that President Ramaphosa is going to drop controversial ministers in a new trimmed cabinet. Sunday Tribune, uh, no surprise, that winning feeling. That's the headline on the front page of the Sunday Tribune. Uh, the story talking about uh, ANC's victory at the country's general elections and speculation about that trim, trimmed cabinet. What might it look like, perhaps without uh, Deputy President David Mabuza? The weekend Argus also going with President Ramaphosa and the ANC's election success as the lead. Uh, the identity of who will be a part of President's uh, uh, cabinet, a focal point, with the headline saying, now the real work begins. The paper says that lobbying is underway to have Nkosaza Nadlamini Zuma as a possible deputy president. Now, there's so much to get through on the show and uh, helping us to make sense of uh, these stories. My guest editors uh, today, Africa Program Coordinator at uh, Committee to Protect a Journalist, Angela Kuntal. Uh, thanks very much indeed for joining us. And uh, also for the first time, on, uh, also on the show, uh, is media analyst Melo Mahujalejo. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and welcome. All right, so those are our guest editors and they'll be chatting to us uh, in a short while uh, about some of these stories and uh, also those on the front pages of your newspapers. Now, South Africa's sixth fully democratic general elections took place this past week and yesterday the results were announced by the country's electoral commission who declared the polls as having been free and fair. Well, one of the pillars that help in delivering a free and fair vote is the media seen as an indispensable player in educating the public, acting as a neutral, objective platform sometimes for debate and analysis. The media can be a powerful tool in ensuring the proper functioning of a democracy. So how did South Africa's media fare in the 2009 elect 19 elections? I also wish to thank the media, which continues to play such a vital role in our democracy 
and which was so important in ensuring that South African people were well informed as they went to vote. The media continues to play a pivotal role in the life of our country and we thank them dearly and we know that many of them did not sleep for much of the time. You are now granted presidential permission to go and sleep. <laughs> what happens here after doesn't really matter. You can go and have a holiday and uh, sleep for a number of weeks. We will get on with the work. Leave it to us. So now why isn't the president sitting here doing my program? I'm up early. So that's what the president had to say. Uh, but we thought we'd uh, check in with people who make it their business to monitor the media. And joining me now is a, a researcher, policy program at uh, Media Monitoring Africa, uh, Azola Diallo. Thanks so much for joining us, Azola. And uh, it's been an interesting time. Mm -hmm. The president said that we did a good job, uh, perhaps because he won. Um, <laughs> but what do you think? What's your general view about uh, the election coverage going into these elections. Okay, thank you, uh, Peter, for having me on your show. Um, I mean, the president is not too far off to say that um, we did quite well, uh, particularly speaking on behalf of the media. Um, but I mean, also, uh, there wasn't really much representation from citizens, but we've seen um, a much bigger jump than previous um, you know, research has indicated. Um, citizens this time around came in second after um, political party voices, um, which is, as I said before, um, a jump that from previous um, right. you know, research. But uh, what we find is that still, uh, you know, the voices are still very much political. Okay. Um, All right, so we'll, we'll unpack it now bit by bit, but let's start with um, how did you track it? How did you check uh, the coverage? What did you do? Okay, so we used an online, internal online um, program called Dexter that we have at Media Monitoring Africa, which scrapes um, all online stories which also appear on print. So we take that, we analyze it, um, we put it into categories, um, and we, we tag for particularly stories that have to do with um, elections. Okay. So yeah, we, so we use keywords that um, speak to, to, to elections. And then with those stories, we have a group of monitors which um, monitor the stories and, and categorizes accordingly. So um, for instance, maybe it's a service delivery protest, okay. uh, it's related to elections. Okay. Um, the Zondo Commission, it's still related to, 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 to elections as well. Oh so um, in that okay, so way. Then what was most talked about? What was covered the most by, by the media? Interesting enough, what was not covered the most was uh, yeah. the issue <laughs> was the issue around land, which I okay. which I found personally very much interesting because uh, a lot of political parties were using that as their campaigning tool. But for the month of, of, of March, which yeah. we um, we analyzed, we find that only you know three percent of the stories out of two thousand three hundred stories focused focused on land, whereas uh, the, the the two particular political parties that were focusing on land each had a, um, a very big share of the voice, one um, ranging at fifty seven percent and other uh, at 10 percent of the media share of voice but uh, we only found uh, that stories uh, related to land which is a very important issue um, in this country at the current this moment. This is interesting is it the politicians driving that message or is it the the, the journalists picking those messages from what the politicians were saying? <laughs> This is a hard one. That's isn't a it? very hard one. Yeah. That's a very hard one, and I, I don't wish to apportion blame yeah. to any of the two um, yeah. groups. That, but I think it, it, it comes from 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 both sides. You know, for instance, when when looking at gender. Also, we found yeah. that uh, you know there was a very scant representation of, of women. Um, okay, so whether these are the voices now, the, yes, the sources actually. The sources that yeah. um, are, are accessed by journalists. So it could be a, a thing of that parties don't necessarily have women as spokespersons or people who speak on behalf of the party. Mm -hmm. But it also could be the media's uh, fault in the sense that they do not actually access um, women in political parties. So they wouldn't want to speak to um, you know maybe a lowly uh, woman. Whereas you know if you speak to the leader of the party, it gains much more okay. traction. So I'd rather speak to Pule Mabe than maybe one of the junior uh, communications officers inside the definitely, party. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Okay. So that could, that could be the case. That could definitely be the case. Okay, so then maybe the media could have looked at, when it comes to citizens, mm. we could have chosen female voices as citizens. How much of a voice did the people have as opposed to the political parties, headshots and that kind of thing of the party people. 
Um, I mean, as, as the, yeah. the stats suggest, yeah. it was only 7% of citizens that were accessed. Really? While 45% uh, goes to political parties. Wow. So that in its, on its own, you know, paints a, a very grim picture. But um, election programs like um, the town hall debates yeah. uh, and um, Democracy Gauge also gave voice to a lot of, you know, ordinary citizens on the ground. Um, and that has to be commended uh, in itself. Oh. So at least people did have a voice, but it's still heavily, uh, you know, political. Right, still right. having, yeah. So wh what, what concerns do you have when you look at all of this and saying, you know, what are the lessons learned? What could we have done better? Um, okay, from a media perspective, um, I would suggest that, you know, journalists, when particularly around election time, when they access political parties, to insist on, you know, looking at policies of the political parties that speak to um, issues such as gender representation, race representation, and demand to, you know, to speak to women and not to that to um, male figures because they've you know, speak, spoken um, for a long time. Uh, our May report also has, uh, uh, sorry, March report yeah. has recommendations at the at the back th that I cannot actually quite recall at this moment. Yeah. But um, if people were to get access to our report, uh, particularly um, media practitioners, there yeah. are quite um, key recommendations that we make there around um, what the media could do better in terms of um, you know stretching the voices of those who have not been given a chance to speak, um, whether it's citizens or it's yeah. women or even children, because we. We tend to forget about children and focus on, you know, adults as if okay. South Africa is only made out of adults. So um, what we did, we thought it would be important to get a sense of what uh, people were thinking themselves about our coverage and uh, whether it maybe even influenced them in how they voted. So we went out on the streets and uh, we got some voices and this is uh, what they told us. The media did give me enough information because I'm all over social media, magazines. So on the recent magazine cover that I read, there was um, a research that has been done, which was sort of analyzing um, different things that um, different political parties have done so far. You know, how they've influenced us as the youth, um, families, everything in general, the economy, like, yeah. So um, I'm a person who prefers doing further research. I don't just believe what the media gives me because um, it could be some propaganda behind it. We, we, we never really know. This is just Where I voted is the biggest voting station. But there wasn't enough. In fact, there was not even one media day. Yes, I did vote. But the media influence, I don't really think so because I didn't change parties. So I did vote for the party I was going to vote for. And the media didn't have an influence on my vote. Well, personally, I try and avoid the media at any cost because I don't believe in the propaganda machine. I put my TV on the sidewalk 10 years ago because I got tired of people forcing things down my throat. So when I think of the media, it would be the posters on the, on the bowls. The media has not influenced my decision. I think they could have done more with letting us know which parties has what type of belief systems or what type of values or what type of... Um, changes in structures and stuff like that. I don't think they did enough. Uh, the media uh, actually did influence me in terms of voting, but still I have a question. The question is that uh, who's funding the media? Okay, very uh, d different f feelings and thoughts about the media. Somebody actually put her TV on the street at one point. All right, so Azola, and I just wonder again to this content. I mean, it's one thing covering a rally and just playing up sounds and it seemed as if they might have wanted a little bit more what does what has just been said mean definitely mm. um i mean of course the people have spoken in terms yeah. of what um, they would like the media to, re to to report them and it's the the the, the duty of the media to actually yeah. you know um report this stuff to to the electorate to help to, to help them make informed decision in terms of who to vote for but that is people have said that there, there was very little of that and as you say that yeah. it's different you know um, actually have a, a thorough zoom in in terms of what the political parties have to offer in terms of their policies than just covering yeah. a rally where the leader of the party will speak so I guess these are lessons that the media should uh, you know take in reflect on and then in the next uh, local government elections that are yeah. due to to come up um, to implement these um, these these things that the people are, are saying. All right, so perhaps in conclusion, Sarah Ramaphosa says we did well. 
overall, what's, what's your take as Media Monitoring Africa? Did the press give fair coverage? Um, and do we get a thumbs up? <laughs> definitely get a thumbs up. <laughs> definitely get a thumbs up. I mean, in terms of, of, of fairness and bias, uh, I think the media generally scored um, quite high. I think 98% um, uh, was fair and then just 2% uh, bias, which is um, irrelevant anyways. Mm. But it's a big jump um, from the research that we did previously where you know there was a lot of uh, bias that we picked up on, on the media. But this time around, they scored a 98%, which is definitely a thumbs up. All right, and uh, more female voices in future, and I think children. by and large, and Definitely children and as children. well. Mm. All right, Azola, thanks so much indeed for your thoughts and uh, your research that you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to meet the National Press Club's first black woman chairperson after 40 years. As part of Africa, we're giving its people the great future it deserves with an investment partner like no other, you. We've invested 120 billion rands of our money and yours into creating more than just hope for this beautiful continent we call home. We're sustaining our soil and enriching lives. We're giving our children a brighter tomorrow. We're investing in small businesses to grow the economy. And we're bringing warmth and light to the people who need it most. And by investing in our planet, we're passing this all on to future generations too. Great things are possible when we invest together. That's why we're invested in changing Africa's tomorrow. The SABC News mobile app is your one-stop digital portal to all the news you need. Stay connected with the latest in breaking news. Watch the SABC News channel along with clips and live streams of all the big news events. And listen to all the SABC News radio stations live, including podcasts and much more. Simply download the SABC News app to your Android or iOS device from either the Play Store or the App Store. SABC News. Independent. Impartial. Welcome back. You're still watching Media Monitor. Now, the National Press Club has elected its new executive committee and management team this uh, past week. Uh, the editor of uh, Pretoria News, Ntando Mahubu, was uh, elected chairperson. And this makes her the first black female to be elected to this position. Uh, let's see if we can join her in uh, Pretoria to chat to her uh, about uh, this uh, welcome appointment and I've got to say it's been 40 years since the National Press Club was uh, formed and uh, this is the first time that they're having a black uh, female chairperson. Perhaps one of the reasons could be if you look around the country and take a look at the newsrooms, you're not seeing a lot of black female editors there. Uh, all right, we're struggling a little bit uh, with uh, connecting with them, hoping to get to, to them now, but I want to just chat to my guests now and uh, get a sense of uh, First two stories that we've heard. Let me start uh, with you, Angela. Welcome back to South Africa. I know Thank you've you. been away for two years, uh, uh, more, three now almost, three, yeah. uh, working at the CPJ. We'll talk about that as well. But you were a woman editor here, um, uh, leading uh, a number of newsrooms, but there weren't a lot of females around you, particularly black ones. Definitely. Well, look, no, there were plenty of females mm. around me, but what I think is quite interesting is that even to this day, we still do not have sufficient black women editors, and yeah. I mean black African women editors, leading newsrooms in the country. I think that's an indictment, and if you, what we've just heard, that for the first time in 40 years, the National Press Club is led by a woman, a black woman, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty shocking. Mind-boggling. Mila, yeah. what, what do you think it could be? Because they've had 25 years. I mean, obviously, the media is a highly contested space in mm. terms of forming and shaping public opinion, right? So for me, one of the things that, like, 
I found very much interesting, especially in like the broadcast media. You'd had like at the point uh, ENCA, you had Matla and being in the newsroom there, even here at SABC, and even uh, I suppose like at this new channel that's come up now, you're sort of having like women representation there. So it's very interesting that in the political governance structures of the media as a whole, media sometimes uh, the women do not uh, penetrate to the highest levels. But then on the other end, if you look at SANIF, SANIF, for example, you do have uh, representation there in terms of women and black women and so on. Yeah, okay, yeah. interesting. All right, let's uh, talk to the woman of the moment now as I'm joined by uh, Ntando Mahubu from our Pretoria studios. Ntando, congratulations on your appointment. Uh, how are you feeling? Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Peter. I'm feeling, um, I'm, I feel very honored and um, a bit overwhelmed. It's, 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 it's not a small um, role to, 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 to play. All right, it really so isn't. we've just been chatting ahead of uh, crossing to you now, and it seems it's sad in a way that it's taken 40 years uh, to see a black woman uh, leading an organization such as this, particularly since we've had 25 years of uh, a democratic society. Um, I guess we can call it sad, um, but I think everything has its time. And um, with a lot of things that we go through in life, it, it, it has to gradually come in. It has to gradually come in. It has to um, have the initial challenges for the appreciation to actually hit yeah. You know. So you're the editor of yeah. Pretoria News. Um, are there the a news editor. The, the news editor of Pretoria news News. Editor. Are there a lot yes. of females, black females in particular, in editor positions uh, uh, across the media? Is it improving? Well, um, my, my, editor is a, my, editor, my editor is a female, mm. and the editor before her was a female. And um, it's not as bad as, as, as it looks from the outside. Yeah. There are um, a lot of women that are in um, leadership positions within the media right now. Um, I, I want to say that we are making inroads okay. into All the right. once dom male-dominated space. All right. Tell us about the press club, the National Press Club. What does it do? How does it function? Who are members? Um, the press club is, a, is an organization of journalists and PR practitioners and um, what we do is that we we bring together these two uh, people so we bring together the journalists and the sources um, onto forums where they can talk where they can th you know there's a more serious aspects of it where the press club will organize um, press briefings and discussion evenings where uh, information is shared but we also have networking forums where our um, where the where the where, where the so-called sources um, sit down with on a, on a more social level with 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 uh, journalists and you know chat and get to understand yeah. each other get to understand the fact that none is 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 an enemy of the other. So how how uh, enriched are you as a as a result of these gatherings and does it improve the journalism does it improve uh, the the sources uh, communication but also just the journalism itself it 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 is, it is ex extremely empowering it is extremely enriching for mm. both the journalists and the sources because there is you know there's always a perception um a perceived perception from from the sources that journalists are these hounds are these people that are out to get them that are out mm -hmm. to to get information that they do not want to give that are going to be hammering away at and trying to get responses that they are not actually willing to give you know and there's also a perception on the side of the journalists that sources do not want to talk to them so what the press club does is that it it provides a forum where each sees the other as just an ordinary citizen you know where each sees the other as um, operating on a level that we all basically mm. want the same thing, which is to share information and share it without any barriers, without yeah. any fear. Yeah. So there are international press clubs like Washington, New Delhi, just to name a couple. Is it similar and is there a sisterhood or a brotherhood uh, with these other press clubs? We do have, um, 
links with, with other uh, national press clubs, I mean with other press clubs, yes. Um, we talk to them from time to time. To time. Um, like every organization, we have to learn from what others do. And we do also do have um, others that, you know, on the, on the odd occasion want to talk to us to find out how we are doing, what we are doing right. Um, so there's, you know, there is constant communication um, just to teach each other and learn from each other. All right, and perhaps so there is a sisterhood. Okay, and perhaps in conclusion, what do you want to do? Where do you want to take the press club under your leadership? Um, under my leadership, I would like to, to to break down the barriers a little bit more. Um, to to have to have more inclusion of journalists in the press club. Um, to 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 foster a a, a better understanding of of who journalists are. With both the sources, um, with both the sources and the communities, mm -hmm. um, to get people to actually understand that journalists are not the enemy of anybody. Journalists are the friend. Are they, you know, they are friends of, of, of both sources. They are friend of both the communities. And all we want to do is to do our job, which is to spread information, correct information. Um, Ntando, congratulations. Up and down. Yeah, congratulations once again on your appointment. We wish you the best of luck uh, under your uh, chairmanship. So Thank you so much indeed. All right. Thank you very much. That was Ntando Mahubu, who's the chairperson of the National Press Club, uh, also the editor of news at the Pretoria News, and uh, the first black female to uh, uh, take up this position uh, in 40 years history of the National Press Club. And she talked about uh, just wanting to get the message across that uh, journalists are good people just trying to do their job. We're going to be chatting about just how difficult sometimes that job is coming up after this. Stay with us. On Trends Travel, we bring you a full guide on all things lifestyle related. With so much to discover, we give you comprehensive reviews of places to visit, music, travel and food. We also explore the arts, whether on or off stage. All this and more, be sure to tune in to Trends Travel, Saturdays at 5.30pm. Hello, I'm Nana, and I want to tell you a bit about Economics Unbound. It is a live studio current affairs program that brings an understanding of the economy, how it operates, and how it is managed. The show seeks to include ordinary South Africans in purposeful and well-informed discussions about the economy. The whole corruption and having to pay people to get businesses, it's like killing our businesses. While providing them with enough information to make better economic and financial decisions. And we need to start thinking of new ways of creating new structures that are relevant at the time. Through this program, audiences can look forward to 30 minutes of deep and tough questioning on the issues of the week. Why do you think that our economy lends itself to such collusive behavior and such concentration of monopolies in key sectors? We've seen that Brent crude oil rise about 30% this year alone. Brent crude that's going steadily firmer speaks to a global economy that's in good shape. What we don't want to see are supply interruptions or sudden spike. The Bank of Athens has become Grow Bank. It plans to be a bank using digital and personable relations with its customers in the agricultural and food value chain space. We're a lucky bank in that we are small. We're already working with artificial intelligence to allow us to, to manage our customer data. Agriculture is a business. If we're going to take people, millions of them out of poverty, we've got to turn agriculture into a mega sector that works for everybody. Welcome back. Now, the uh, Friday the 3rd of May marked uh, World Press Freedom Day under the theme Media for Democracy, Journalism and Elections in Times of uh, Disinformation. Now, a global conference ran from the 1st to the 3rd of May in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia at the African Union headquarters. Leaders from across the globe celebrated the day with some calling for improved press freedom. Yet questions remain as to why journalists across the globe continue to suffer assaults from government 
governments uh, for doing their jobs. Uh, recent Reporters Without Borders uh, f a Press Freedom Index saw South Africa rank 31 out of 180 countries around the world. On the continent, the top-ranked country is Namibia, and sadly on the other end of the scale, Somalia and Sudan are being placed 175 on the list of 180 countries. Uh, Sudan has a very poor record of hostile action against journalists. On, and on Press Freedom Day, I spoke to Sudanese freelance journalist uh, Saha Haj Amin. In the time of al-Bashir, we as a journalist suffered repression, execution, and detention, and accused us uh, we are sitting as we are sitting in the side of the uh, revolution, as the revolution, the opposition of the last government. And nowadays, we are still suffering also, but this time, from some groups within the administrators, uh, accused us with incredibility and working for others to put down their revolution. Actually, we tried just to uh, relieve the trust in the administration. And several times, we're trying to contact some media offices for the forces of change and SPA uh, in Sudan uh, to uh, ensure the safety of journalists. And a few days uh, before a week, I think, one of uh, our colleagues, he is a reporter, was beaten, and some of the uh, people called themselves a revolutionist. But they just have it on standby, they just in case. They smashed his camera. Yesterday, also, one of our colleagues, the reporter of uh, Al Ghat Channel, was beaten uh, near the uh, administration square. So we contact me and some of the professional journalists, contact the media officers to stop that uh, corruption and that disturbance of the uh, uh, journalists. And just today uh, morning, I received a response from the coordinator the media coordinator of SBA, the uh, uh, Sudanese Professional uh, Society, uh, Mashair Adaraj, she told me that they um, uh, form a special committee to ensure the safety of journalists, and uh, the private interest was provided to journalists also. Uh, I think this is a positive step toward media and journalism uh, in order to enable us work in a good weather and produce a good professional uh, news uh, for the all over the world, not just for Sudanese people. So that's uh, Sudanese uh, freelance journalist uh, speaking to me uh, on World Press Freedom Day, sharing her thoughts and concerns that uh, despite this uh, revolution that seems to be playing out there, that things haven't changed all that much yet. Well, this year's uh, Press Freedom Day also came at a time Reporters Without Borders released their annual Press Freedom Index, and it's not painting a a great picture. The international body says that uh, press freedom is receding worldwide with countries such as the United States and other large democracies uh, reaching what they described as a tipping point. And as measured by their own index, uh, press freedom has worsened by 13% since 2013. Well, someone who knows all too well the challenges faced by our journalists is the Africa Program Coordinator at the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, the CPJ. Uh, now now based in New York, we're now joined by Angela Quintel, who uh, many will remember as the former editor of the Mail and Guardian here at home, a veteran journalist with two decades of work at various publications and newsrooms. Angela, welcome home. Welcome back. How's it been? It's been great to be home. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I suppose you've come backwards and forwards, but uh, you've seen a lot of history over time. 1994, you were there for those elections, um, and there were very different kinds concerns for journalists back then. Um, at that stage, uh, the police and the authorities were quite firm. Concerns still for journalists now? Very much so, but a different concern, yeah. if I may say. So in 94, there was a fear of physical uh, uh, safety, right? Physical harassment. 25 years later, and we're talking about a totally different ball game. And that is really about digital harassment. And the one concern that we have seen, particularly also over this election period in South Africa, but elsewhere in the world, is how social media and online harassment has really uh, shot mm. right up there, um, and in particular against women journalists. And for the Committee to Protect Journalists, that's been a major concern for us. 
one of the reasons why I am here, not only to vote, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but also to, to monitor yeah. and to see how things have actually panned out for journalists in this particular mm. sphere. And I suppose the danger with social media in particular is that you can be anonymous in your threats and hide behind pseudonyms and so on and so forth and join this, this uh, almost generate hate uh, speech uh, often. Very much so. Mm. So you have troll armies yeah. that, that many are actually, yes, anonymous. There are others that are deliberately put out there by, as we saw with the Balbont uh, Pottinger affair. But um, yeah, there's something about the anonymity of social media that obviously emboldens people. Um, and you see it in terms of just the harassment against women journalists in particular in that field is just, well, not only women journalists, women in general, it's incredibly toxic. And often you actually just realize, well, how do you stop that? You can say to Twitter, please take that down. But at the end of the day, the effects on, on journalists and female journalists in particular is something that I don't mm. think the public necessarily understands, the emotional trauma. Uh, the fact that some journalists and senior journalists are even contemplating leaving the profession, yeah. that's how bad it is. All right. So as uh, Africa Program Director, you look at Sub-Saharan Africa uh, quite a bit. And I just wonder across the continent, here at home, we are quite lucky that we don't see the state and the authorities uh, harassing journalists. But I guess this is something that still happens across the continent. Very much so. So South Africa, Namibia, Ghana, I'd say we certainly are the beacons when it comes to press freedom in sub-Saharan Africa. But elsewhere on the continent, it's, it's abysmal. So you look at Eritrea. Let's just look at the number of journalists in jail in Eritrea, at least 16. You turn to Cameroon. This is in terms of our annual prison census. In Cameroon, there were seven journalists in prison for their work. Um, you see journalists being harassed, journalists being arrested, publications being closed down, uh, broadcasters being taken off air. Uh, it is a problem. It certainly appears to be worse. Um, and uh, what can we do about it? You know? And I think at the end of the day, it's really important for the public also to understand that this is not only about journalists. And when journalists are arrested, oh, it's a matter for journalists. It's not. Because when you arrest a journalist, you actually, in essence, shutting up a journalist, but you're not then, you're actually ensuring that the citizens don't have a voice, right? That they don't have yeah. access to information. So that is the bigger problem when you see uh, the deterioration of uh, press freedom. And you felt it firsthand as well, didn't you? You had uh, an issue in Tanzania when you visited there. Take us through what happened to you. Sure. Well, we were there on a, on a trip where we were meeting other journalists, trying to get a sense of what was going on in Tanzania. Uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists actually had an invitation. We were there legally, despite the fact that the government claimed that we weren't. Um, and I think what, what happened was we were, we were detained for a couple of hours uh, uh, by the intelligence services. Um, but I think what was important about that uh, experience was that while we had the international community, South Africans, everyone out coming out in support of us, what was important was that people finally realized what was going on in Tanzania themselves, right? Mm. In Tanzania, there are journalists who are being harassed, are being detained. Others have gone missing. Uh, Zori Gwanda is a, a local journalist, a freelance journalist that went missing for two years. And suddenly people woke up to the fact that the situation is dire in, in Tanzania. So as I say to people, the silver lining was that, yes, we were detained. We were treated abominably. But at the end of the day, we were able to get out. Yeah. It's those journalists who remain behind that uh, we need to worry about. All right. So World Press Freedom Index says uh, that the f uh, Reporters Without Borders uh, Press Freedom Index says that there's been a decline 13% in the world since 2013. Are we in decline on the continent or is there glimmers of hope with social media pushing back uh, against uh, authorities? Yeah, so it's a mixed bag. Mm. We are in decline in many countries, but let me at least give you the good news. Yeah. Let's look at Ethiopia. So once upon a time, <laughs> two years ago, mm -hmm. Ethiopia was the second uh, uh, worst country in terms of jailing journalists in sub-Saharan Africa. You now have a new prime minister. There's reform in the air. There are no longer any journalists in jail in Ethiopia since 2004. I mean, that's pretty huge. Mm -hmm. Look at the Gambia. For many, many years, you had Yaya Jame, a dictator, 
you had journalists murdered, you had journalists having to go into exile, newspapers shut down. Now under Adama Barrow, again, there's that reform. But then you look elsewhere on the continent, yeah. and unfortunately things do not look that great. I mean, we just have to look at Cameroon, right? You know, Cameroon, people have forgotten that there is a civil war going on there, and journalists are caught up uh, for both sides. Um, I could go on, but yeah. the fact is it is mixed, but there are glimmers of hope. All right. Okay, Mila, I'm going to bring you in on, on this uh, conversation now. And, uh, you know, we, we, we take it for granted here in South mm -hmm. Africa, you know, press freedom and the attacks now sometimes are from political parties, and, uh, but mostly citizens uh, on social media. Mm -hmm. um, your thoughts uh, on, on this whole press freedom in the South African context? I mean, it's very interesting that a uh, point that Angela raised in terms of like the transition from threats on physical security to now sort of online harassment, right? And for me, within the broader context, the way that I would see that it's almost like the harassment has gone away from the point of news production mm -hmm. to the point of news dissemination, right? And that point of news dissemination now is a social media, right? So this is complicated by the fact that journalists themselves now become uh, sort of entangled within the stories that they report, right? Because on social media, they present themselves as their own persons yeah. as opposed to agents of news agencies, right? So I think that for me has complicated the issue a bit. In terms of the world press freedom and the theme of uh, disinformation, this is very interesting. I mean, this is something that at the moment in the US, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, they're trying to deal with, right? Because people are calling for Facebook to be broken up because there's just too much power. And then this is, has a very negative impact on terms of the news cycle, in terms of influencing people, right? So for me, I think this is going to be something that's very interesting because what it does is that social media, in as much as it has enabled people to connect more and given people platforms to disseminate the information, it has also created mm -hmm. enclaves of sort of like homogenous opinions to some extent. And yeah. that, in a sense, I think has become very negative for sort of progressive uh, uh, liberalism in the world. All right. Angela earlier on talked about uh, some female journalists in particular even mm -hmm. thinking about withdrawing. Yes. Um, and I wonder, and I've seen it around me, mm -hmm. um, people, journalists now starting to self-censor. Mm -hmm because they're scared of the backlash. And this is a consequence of this uh, on, uh, online onslaught. Yes. No, yeah. I, I, absolutely. I mean, obviously, the moment you put yourself out there now is that people now start to infringe on your personal space, right? Mm. So for me, that's very interesting because the other issue that's also come up with the elections, right, was around um, journalism and uh, independent analysts at ENCA uh, mm -hmm. where they won... Uh, analyst had an interview with a uh, James Self as to whether or not what is the distinction between being a journalist versus being yeah. somebody who has a certain agenda to push, right? So for me, that obviously now puts the whole question into uh, into a spotlight, right? Because people then tend to feel that, no, certain people are pushing agendas instead yeah. of actually reporting the news. All right, Angela, perhaps a final word on this, uh, this issue. You've got a global view as well, uh, working with uh, colleagues there. And I just wonder... <laughs> Where are we going? How do we improve things for journalists? Who, whose responsibility is it? Is it the authorities? Uh, our citizens need to wake up. What, what, what do we need to do? Yeah, I don't think it's uh, only one sector mm. of society. It really is across the board. So yes, newsrooms, you know, media companies mm. really have to take responsibility. Uh, let's also look at the fact that many journalists are now freelance journalists. Yeah. So how do you ensure that freelance journalists who don't have the backing of their media organizations are protected? Um, and ultimately, yes, governments play a role, but I think importantly, it really is the community. I think what we have is a disconnect between journalists and the communities that they work in. And I think that is really problematical. It's once communities actually understand that, in fact, the journalist is not the enemy, mm -hmm. that we will see an improvement. And for me, the biggest concern, and particularly here in South Africa as well, is that I do think that there is this massive disconnect. And that is why you see, you don't see the backlash when journalists are being attacked. You mm -hmm. know, it's, oh, they deserve that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that, to me, is incredibly worrying. All right, okay, a lot of work to be done. <laughs> well, journalists uh, were also busy with the uh, newspapers uh, coming up with their headline stories, and there seems to be a theme coming through about, okay, you've won, Mr. President, what next? Let's take a look at some of these uh, uh, stories. Uh, Milo, what, what grabbed your attention of, on the pages of the front pages? So for me, the interesting story is about uh, I think it's on the Independent about Sunday Independent, yeah. yes, and the tussle for position number two, right? 
because the default position over the past couple of uh, presidencies has been that the deputy president of the ANC would be the deputy president of the country, right? So people seem to be floating the story now that actually that might not be the case, right? So for me, that would be very interesting in terms of how they managed to convince Didi Mabuza not to want to be uh, deputy president, right? Because part of the problem there is that he has a very strong constituency, and that constituency has come through very strongly for the ANC in the elections. I think Bumalang got something like 60, 70 percent mm -hmm. of the vote. So that for me is going to be very interesting. But but then again, it brings to, um, to, uh, to, to highlight the issue of whether or not some of these stories are being peddled by people who have an interest in actually pushing a certain narrative or not, right? Or whether there's people that now want to float this idea that no, Didi Mabuza shouldn't be president. So that for me is going to be interesting uh, going forward. Okay. Um, Angela, you were an editor in your time. And I'm just looking at the front page of the Sunday Times. Are you allowed to say Cyril rescues the ANC? Because that seems to me like an opinion rather than a fact, because we don't know for sure. He well, could have contributed, but what do you think? I think that given uh, what they did do, do was that they analysed yeah. the fact that the ANC nationally did show that somehow people did vote for the so-called Cyril factor, mm. whereas provincially, I mean, let's just look at Gauteng. Yeah. I mean, the ANC barely scrapes through. But if I may just follow yeah, up on, that, yeah. on what... So I, I think what's really interesting mm. is that, yes, there is, seems to be some debate about who should be the deputy president mm. of the country. Mm -hmm. And I think, let's just go back to what media monitoring yeah. Africa said about, you know, you have the majority of the electorate in this country happens to be women, right? Mm. And yet... You have the ANC also talking about a 50-50, so their lists reflect that. But why is it that the top six, and certainly why can it not be that mm. South Africa can be led by a woman president? Let's accept now we have Cyril as the president, but I really do think it's time to have another deputy president that is a woman, and I do not believe that one has to be stuck with uh, the ANC's top six uh, and letting them then move to positions yeah. in government. So uh, for me, I think th what was certainly interesting mm -hmm. from this is that the names are being bandied about. And of course, Zana Damini Zuma, uh, uh, Lundiwe Sisulu, yeah. you know, I is this the time? Are we going to have a, a, a cabinet that is also going to reflect uh, w the, the, yeah. the demographics of the country? But more importantly, and I think this is what you mm -hmm. see throughout the papers, is it is now time for Cyril to make his mark and will he do that? Is he going to ensure that the cabinet is leaner? Is he going to ensure that we don't have as many deputy ministers? Is he going to ensure that actually uh, we have new faces, faces that aren't contaminated? Yeah. And unfortunately, as we all know, that the election list of the African National Congress, unfortunately, does have names in there that does rise, uh, raise eyebrows, particularly if uh, this narrative of Cyril coming to the rescue and uh, saving the country from state capture is, yeah. is going to come to fruition. So what's likely to happen then? So for me, I think in terms of media coverage, one thing that I'd really like yeah. to see going forward, right, is the media really putting hard questions to Soroma Maposa. Yeah. Because there's a lot of things that need to change. And sometimes you sort of get the impression that the media is sort of like their PR agents yeah. for the presidency and not really calling to task. I understand there may have been some pressure perhaps with the upcoming elections to ensure that actually the change and the transition which happened at Nazarek continues. But I think now going forward, hard questions need to be put to him because ultimately that will stand the country in good stead. All right. Was there anything else that to draw your attention in the papers, Sanjana? Yeah, so again, yeah. in terms of the leadership of political parties, so Cyril is saved by the South African electorate, but let's look at opposition political yeah. parties and let's look at the official opposition. Mm -hmm. And so one of the stories there is that there's a meeting tomorrow of the Democratic Alliance top structure. Um, are we going to have uh, Musi Maimani as the leader going forward. I mean, those are the issues that yeah. we need to look at. The other thing is that we need to look at the smaller parties, mm -hmm. parties like the Pan-Africanist Congress and others who have this liberation history mm -hmm. and have yet failed to, to, uh, to make any meaningful yeah. progress. I mean, the PAC has won one seat. You look at a Zapo totally off yeah, the map. Crazy. So it would be also, for me, I'd like to see that realignment mm -hmm. uh, to see whether, you know, come the local government elections, mm -hmm. are all these political parties still going to try and, and, and win a couple of council seats or are we going to see strategic alliances yeah. between like-minded political parties and that's something I'd like to watch. All right. Just one more thing. That, I mean, 
absolutely important for me that she mentioned the local government elections, right? One thing that I found almost uh, misleading in this current election cycle was our focus on social media and our thinking that social media yeah. is sort of like representative it's of what's happening universe. in the country. And I think part of the problem is that like with the uh, expectations where EFF fell short is because they were very strong on social media, but actually maybe on the ground they weren't as strong. So going forward, I suppose, like for me, media's, uh, media uh, instruments that tend to be very much more uh, penetrating to the country tend to be like your sort of your radio uh, broadcast, yeah. your vernacular radio broadcast. I think those type of instruments should be uh, drawn within the fold in terms of analyzing trends in the media. Angela, Mila, we've run out of time. We could yes. chat forever, but thanks so much indeed for coming through and uh, sharing your uh, insights with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Right. And for you at home, thanks so much indeed for making a date with us. Uh, let's do it again, same time next week. You've been watching Media Monitor, and we'll be back next week. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.